And that also we would like to discuss here on the panel. Um, although we are not really weather or climate experts, we are more working on technologies and solutions on how to mitigate climate change. But one of our main drivers why we are going for those research is the climate change. It's not the only one, but it is one of the drivers. And so that we want to discuss. We will uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, the panel that we see here. Then all the panelists will have a short introductory note. And then uh, we open up the floor and hope that we can have a fruitful discussion with all the participants. Um, who can I introduce? The, build, the pictures is a bit dark, but first I would like to introduce Professor Alfredo Salibian. He is sitting from your side, the second from the left. Then he will represent, our idea was that we have from all the continents uh, on the earth one representative. We didn't really manage to do so, um, but almost, and Professor Salibian will represent South America, but he's Argentinian, he's a local here. Then we have, you already know her, Professor Natasha Markovska, uh, sitting in the center here in the table, and she will represent Europe here in our circle. And then we have <clears throat> Professor Tsong Yi Huan, and Although his name does not sound very African, today as a representative of South Africa, he will represent Africa here on the table. And then we expected to have Ms. Ying He, but she just gave us the information that she is in the hotel and is ill. She also couldn't attend yesterday the social events, so we don't will have Ms. Ying He. And she was also not a very Australian name, but she was planned to represent Australia here. And finally, in the round, we have Professor Adonis Georgi. He is also a local one here from Argentina, but he will not represent South America. Professor Georgi will represent the oceans. <laughs> so then we have almost the earth covered. I will start with my introduction and how I experienced in my country, in Germany, uh, maybe it's climate change or it's still weather. And what you see here is still the panelist table that, that we had a dinner a few days ago. And some Southern European people, they always say, and especially Italian like to say that the German are really sad people. And the reason why German people are so sad is that it always rains in Germany. So even then they have summer, they always have rain. And that is why they are not able to laugh. <clears throat> and the reason I think who knows traveling is that for sure we have also some sunshine but it's a normal summer that high pressure and low pressure areas uh, will change one after another and some days we have sun some days we have rain and so on but what we experience since a few years is for example the german summer in 2018 and i live myself in the city of cologne and there we have a quite large river, or at least in European sense, it's a large river, it's the Rhine River, and there we experienced the lowest water levels ever had been measured, and ships couldn't go anymore. And that was a quite uh, strange thing we experienced, because we didn't have rain over almost two months, and that we never experienced before in Germany. And I know whenever we have weather extreme situations and we ask the weather or the climate people, is this now climate change? They always answer, ah, yes, could be, but it could be still weather. We always have had a lot of rain. We always have had low rain or droughts. But 
This time it was a bit different and they and I was really surprised when the experts said, yes, that is now definitely climate. And they said the climate researchers um, are blaming the unusual warming of the Arctic for the unusual weather in the Northern Hemisphere for the last few years. And the region around the North Pole heats up much faster than the regions more in the middle latitudes. And the asymmetric warming of the northern hemisphere now leads to the weather phenomenon that brought, for example, Germany these eternal summer times. And because the lower temperature gradient between pole and the drop train that normally causes our changing weather situation with high pressure and low pressure areas. And so that was the first time when also the climate people say, yes, this weather indication is really a cause of climate change. And also in 2019, we experienced a second time the same droughts. And also again, we had the experience that our Rhine River had a very low uh, water levels. And that is also quite important um, transport way for our economy. So, <clears throat> Some of the most important industries are located close to the river that they are supplied with raw materials and they had a problem. And also the hard coal fired power plants, uh, some of our hard coal we get from Australia for example, is always delivered via Rotterdam through ships going the Rhine River and they couldn't also not go anymore in that Rhine River. And also the fuel is distributed largely via Rotterdam uh, through the Rhine River and they couldn't go and so some filling stations in those two summers even uh, closed because they didn't have fuel anymore. And maybe what is for the Stavis participants even more important, Stavis Cologne will have its dinner and party on a ship cruising on the Rhine River this year in September and uh, we still hope uh, that maybe this year we don't have a drought. But the ship is still there, it cannot leave, so we can have the party then just staying on the ground. <laughs> and uh, not everything for economy, it was the first time that we really see that climate change is also a problem to economy, even in such a, a northern country like Germany. But it also has positive aspects. Uh, since two years, we are not any more sad people. We are now a happy people. And when you come to Germany, you see the people jumping around because they are so happy. They experience so much sun. So that was my first introductory notes uh, for opening the discussion. And now I would like to hand over first uh, to Professor Salibian. And he will give his introductory notes for South America. And as he, I learned, already retired, he will give us a quite long-term experience over the last 30 years, uh, what he experienced in that field. And I also got just a present from Professor Salibian, La Argentina y el Cambio Climatico. So I think uh, he is an expert in that field. I would like to, to say that my first initial studies began in the 65s. They were oriented uh, to a variety of aspects of the chemical limnology of the lagoons of the Provincia de Buenos Aires. The Buenos Aires province in Argentina is a place, uh, <clears throat> part of the of the country uh, that have uh, over 1,000 lakes. Uh, so the study of this uh, material from the ecophysiological or ecotoxicological point of view was very important because uh, the, the, uh, uh, the chemical aspects of the lagoons are extremely important for people. Uh, the research involved 40 people, mostly technical and teaching of the Faculty of Natural Sciences of the museum, and with the 
support of the Ministry of Agrarian Affairs of the province. Uh, the province of Buenos Aires, where are those lagoons, occupy an area of 307,000 uh, kilometers, square kilometers. And uh, a human population in, 19, in 2018 was approximately 17 uh, million people and 11 million of those uh, millions are in the metropolitan area of, this, of the country. So you can imagine that we have many environmental problems, too much. Uh, the lagoons of the province that we have studied began, as I said, in 1965, which is a time in which uh, the climate change was unknown, practically. However, with, uh, as, as time went on, uh, la, the, the territory of the province uh, was uh, uh, affected by, by different uh, systems, lakes, lagoons, rivers of, of different magnitude and reservoir uh, and shallow lakes. Recently, wetlands have been incorporated into these regions as protective tools for lagoons. In the initial time of our project in 1965-1966, we were able to monitor 25 of those lagoons integrally as possible from uh, the point of view that uh, they may be food providers. The aquatic systems, in particular, are considered ecologically important and are threatened by the, an increasing variety of changes induced by human actions, like global climate change. The ob objectives of our study was oriented over time to the recognition and quali-quantitative description of the disturb, disturbing environmental factors within the framework of a new scientific discipline which was born at that time, the ecotoxicology. So from the first part of the, of the program, without any uh, uh, reference to the uh, chemistry from the toxicological point of view, we went to this aspect in, in the lapse in the period of approximately 10 years. Aquatic or continental ecotoxicology integrated the studies, the, the results of studies in the field of some particular aspects refer to the metabolism of the water bodies, the well-being of the population, animal populations, both vertebrates and invertebrates, aquatic and terrestrial, effects of anthropic and ecological toxics into lagoons and their environment. And in recent years, we are in, in danger, very important ecological danger, with the fact that the pharmaceutical and uh, emergent uh, toxics are uh, directly uh, uh, presented to the water body, bodies and affecting a lot of uh, uh, animals uh, that live in, in those uh, bodies. 
The more recently, regarding information regarding a large number of species richness found in water, recognized several species as we called biomarkers and bioindicators being incorporated to the ecotoxicological studies. And uh, the impacts, economical or health impacts on the associated human communities to the lagoons and the, the responses to the environmental mitigation protocols as responses to the alteration due to the global climate change was one of the main activities in our group. The mentioned uh, objectives were associated to stable or unstable factors in their annual variation cycles. The importance of soils, for example, chemical factors and their incidence to explain presence, absence, or disappearance of freshwater species in each body or lagoon under stressful condition, new conditions. The other objective was the uh, was related to the chemical aspects whose dynamics and temporary effects by prolonged, prolonged changes, physical and meteorological factors provided by the global climate change were added, which modified some of their initial beginning parameters and over time they generated new limnological baselines, which in turn increased the variety of anthropic pollutants from agricultural, industrial, or urban beginning. And the physical chemical complexity and the various associated risks. And finally, uh, we must mention the determination that the determination of the typology of the characteristic ecosystems of each region, applying and articulating the elements of different scientific disciplines. In, in summary, I am trying to show you that a very extremely complicated ecosystem of lagoons in, in one of the uh, lagoons of the ecology in, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, is a, an area which is suffering critical changes, modifying the structure and the uh, ecological uh, significance. In order to understand these, uh, these changes associated to the climate change, uh, a new project was began, began in, 19, in 20, uh, 2013. Uh, the, this was in the, in the area of what we call as Argentine project for monitoring and prospecting of aquatic environments. In other words, responses from lagoons to external stimuli. The activities began in 2013 and main of, uh, the main of object was to study the responses of the Pampas lagoons to external stimuli, simple, uh, for example, climate and associated variability changes linked to change in land use, which is a critical point in Argentina, and other anthropic effects studied with the help of automatic 
recorders. The project uh, called Pampa 2 Pampa is made up of a network of research carried out by various scientists in 10 academic institutions and different laboratories associated with 13 continental water bodies, lagoons in the Buenos Aires province from different cities covering the whole surface. This network is uh, made of uh, by a scientific co cooperation space that has continuous and standards, standardized and extended information in time for the responses of the Pampas lagoons ecosystems regarding climate variability and changes in land use and other anthropic effects. In a context of permanent changes in agricultural practices, understanding to extend to, to extent uh, to which the hydrological and biochemical metabolism of the lagoons respond to these changes becomes extremely important. This requires the articulation, articulation of the information generated in coordinated approaches by different research groups from 10 academic groups working in coordinated coordinated manner. Uh, finally, I would like to say that the network, this network is directly related to the International Global Lake Environmental Observatory Network uh, as a uh, supporting uh, structure. For those uh, that are uh, uh, interested in more details, details of the aquatic ecosystems in the Buenos Aires province, uh, I would like to offer uh, to get a copy of one of the ch a chapter that I was I I wrote a few e e two or three years ago, and I will leave the original to, to doctor, uh, so you can uh, make copies of that. Uh, okay, I think that this is enough to, uh, to show uh, the, the importance of a part of our country uh, and the lagoons in particular uh, with uh, in relation with the coming climate change. Uh, he showed uh, a book, Climate Change in Argentina. You, you can uh, get a copy of that in the in scientific li libraries and uh, almost 300 pages <coughs> are uh, in that book referred to the situation, the particular risks and the, the future, possible future ways in which the climate change will affect our systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then we switch over to Europe and inviting Natasha for her introductory notes and giving a look to the near future. Um, so uh, in, uh, in response uh, to the Paris Agreement's invitation to pursue efforts for keeping global warming uh, to 1.5 degrees and compared to uh, compared to pre-industrial levels and also fully in line with uh, the global agenda for achieving uh, sustainable development goals, the European Commission presented a long-term strategic vision to reduce greenhouse gases emissions 
showing how Europe can lead the way to carbon neutrality, economy uh, with net zero greenhouse gases emissions. Since uh, my uh, area is uh, climate change mitigation and deals more with the emissions and uh, uh, reasons for climate change, and not really for uh, effects and risks from them, uh, so I, I, I would not be able that much uh, to answer the question whether it is uh, climate or weather, but I would like to, uh, to discuss with the panel the major trends uh, which, uh, uh, which will, um, which upon which the achieving the climate uh, neutrality will uh, rely on. Uh, so, uh, the, striking, the striking and well recognized fact is the threat is here and now. And this is the headline, recent headline from CNN, but also uh, fi findings from uh, uh, UK's uh, scientists uh, who showed that oceans are warming at the same rate as if five Hiroshima bombs were dropped in every second. Can you imagine how much a heat is uh, delivered to the, uh, to, the, to the earth from the atmosphere. And European cities are already on average one degree warmer than in the uh, 20th century, and everybody can feel that. Uh, well, Paris Agreement uh, is the first universal uh, agreement about uh, uh, world dealing uh, collectively to reduce emissions, but it seems that uh, what the countries pledge uh, voluntarily to do with uh, reducing of their emission is not enough, because with the current pledges, we are on the way of uh, keeping the global warming uh, about uh, 3%, 3% um, degrees by the end of the century, so much more is needed if we want to uh, achieve two degrees and even more if we want to achieve 1.5 degrees goal. So uh, there are many ways, as uh, yesterday was shown uh, in my presentation, but of course uh, the uh, renewables will have um, uh, dominant role uh, in the decarbonization pathways. And we have uh, fastest growing renewables, trends of, of, of uh, growing renewables uh, very fast, uh, leading the uh, utilization of solar and wind in the uh, electricity sector. And um, here uh, the prices of renewables uh, are shown and uh, as a not only climate concern, but also technological maturity, maturity is a kind of a, to blame about these fastest growing uh, uh, renewables. And um, as you can see here, that, that even in Germany and in many countries in the world, uh, we, have, uh, we can produce energy from renewables even cheaper than uh, from fossil fuels. Then, well, uh, it is so today, but still we have uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, continue to, to dominate this uh, inconvenient truth. And uh, we have, uh, a, but and still a great amount of, uh, of subsidies um, allocated for, to support uh, utilization of uh, fossil fuels. Also, uh, today we can see a dramatic shift of uh, financial markets and clean energy investments have largely overtaken uh, fossil fuels. This is uh, these purple boxes of the pillars uh, on, the, on the graph. Environmental economy is growing fast and um, uh, really faster than the overall economy, as, and, the, and uh, 
as shown in uh, this figure, the employment and gross value added related to environmental economy is much higher than compared to overall economy. But uh, the inconvenient truth is that all these benefits from the growth of environmental economy are spreading unevenly. And today we have uh, uh, carbon intensive regions are most at, at, at risk because of, uh, uh, they, they experience uh, the threat of losing a lot of jobs in fossil fuels industry. And also uh, more and more Europeans are unable to pay their utility bills in recent years. Trend number five, uh, we have a dramatic transformation of energy demand because uh, at the moment a third of world's energy consumption now is covered by mandatory standards. And uh, this, dramatic, this is comparison between 2015 and 2010 and we see dramatic changes in the level of uh, coverage with, uh, in different um, uh, sectors like lighting exhibiting more standards, uh, light duty vehicles, space heating, space cooling, water heating appliances, everywhere we have uh, progressively Im imposed more and more standards on how we use energy in these uh, sectors. But, uh, always but, uh, this technological progress will not relieve consumers from their responsibility to make sustainable choices. And still, there will be a need for responsible consu consu consumption. Uh, this is just a, a short um, uh, picture of that, uh, because um, uh, unsustainable patterns of consumption really uh, hinders the possibility to achieve a complete decarbonization. And if, we, if the cattle is considered as a country, uh, then uh, the, this country would rank third uh, in the world as per greenhouse gases emissions after China and the United States. This is really just uh, emphasizes uh, the importance of, uh, of responsible consumption. In, of food in this case. Well, um, digitalization is also a main of the, one of the main pathways of uh, decarbonization of, uh, of energy uh, um, uh, sector. And uh, we have more and more IT companies uh, ramping up uh, energy investments. And also uh, the number of smart homes in European Union is dramatically growing and uh, uh, expected to increase tenfold by 2021. Electrification, renewables and digitalizations are giving rise to a new generation of small producers. We have uh, started the process of democratization in, in the energy sector. And here we see the example when, uh, through the example, uh, uh, here so German citizens own uh, roughly one third of the country's renewable electricity capacity. So, and uh, yeah, in, under these circumstances, we see a new role of blockchain uh, and now even uh, more than 265 million euros are invested in Europe uh, for blockchain technology applications in the energy sector. And uh, uh, more and more we will see a pivotal role of uh, Asia East Asia, Asia into uh, the decarbonization of energy uh, sector. And uh, this energy demand surges in Asia um, drives uh, dramatic innovation in, in new technologies. 
Uh, just an example, so which uh, the electric vehicles, half of the world's electric vehicle sales are in China. And also China set to dominate global battery cell production. And here look at uh, the man te uh, top 10 manufacturers of solar panels in 2004 and in 2018. In 2004, uh, only, only one Chinese company. And in 2018, almost all leading companies for production of solar panels are coming from China. And innovation is uh, gradually delivering on the promising technologies. Uh, here we have uh, private research spending on, uh, it dominates over the public spendings. Uh, and uh, here the leading role are investments in sustainable transport and then follows energy efficient systems uh, carbon capture and utilization technologies. But again, Europe uh, does not uh, very well compared to other uh, big countries. And um, uh, just uh, in terms of uh, research and innovation investments as a share of, of uh, GDP. Yes, uh, those were the main nine trends uh, which will somehow um, help understand whether this uh, neutrality, proclaimed neutrality, not only in Europe or, and at world level can be achieved. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Natasha. I think you put up a lot of uh, discussion material for the next hour here. <laughs> And now we continue going to Africa, to South Africa especially, and invite uh, Professor Juan for his uh, opening remarks. Yes, Juan. Uh, actually, probably is the only person come from South Africa to this conference. So there's a South Africa. You can say South Africa on the world, I can say it's a lovely country. This is one of the reasons. I moved to South Africa in 2001 from China. It has a very good, very attractive uh, climate, environment. The weather condition is so nice. So look at the temperature in different areas. So in the summer season, the highest temperature is around 30 degrees. The lowest temperature in the, sum in the summer season is about 10 to 15 degrees. And in the winter, the high temperature 20 degrees, the lowest temperature about 0 to 5 degrees. So the weather condition is so lovely. This so comfort environment is good for the human beings. It's also good, very good for the animals. And then the Kruger National Park. I think is everyone knows Kruger National Park. The size is quite big, even bigger than some countries. Okay? You can see the temperature and then the, the, the rainfalls yeah, on the average through different, different months. So it's very attractive. And uh, recently, in the recent years, some extreme weather conditions happened. And uh, I'll just give you some examples. In January 2018, officials in Cape Town announced, announced that the city of 4 million people, that's the, size, that's, it, that's the city size, was 3 million away from drowning after the municipal water. And uh, on April 12, 2008, the same year, was to be the date of the largest drought induced municipal water failure in the modern society. So that means what that what happened during that three months of our time, the residents are not allowed to use the water on the flushing of the toilets, the showers, and the daily life. So this is a challenge to the to the citizens' life. So the picture shows the What's it? The, 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 the sand blows across the, the dam. Generally, there's a lot of water in that dam, but during that time, the water is gone, and then the sand blows everywhere. So that's in 2018, very extreme condition in terms of this drought. 
This is uh, my experience in last year. Last year from February to August, during this more than one half year, half years of time, there was no rains in these seven months. No rains. And suddenly, in the coming, this recent two months of time, you can see the flooding everywhere in that province. Some picture related to the school, some picture related to the hospital, and then all these facilities doesn't work. Doesn't work. So that is the challenge in terms of the dry and the flooding. Extreme weather condition. This is the record of the extreme temperature for some particular area. The highest temperature, this is in last year, last November. Yeah, last, last year, November 2019. The highest temperature recorded in that small town is over 50 degrees. Over 50 degrees. So that is extreme condition. And then fire, the number of the fire in South Africa, from this figure we can see gradually increase. And uh, some other general observation I can say is the storm. South Africa has three, more than 3,000 kilos of uh, coastline. And uh, the coast area of South Africa, particularly in Cape Peninsula, have been um, impacted by the heavy waves and the storm surge during the violent coastal storms. However, such events haven't been severe enough to limit the de development. And then the sea level. Regarding the sea level rise, significant increase beyond the global average ha uh, haven't been observed. And then the drop, the dry, dry trend has been observed for western portion of that country and the surrounding area during the second half of the century. It has been shown that severe summer drought in South Africa tend to occur and uh, uh, under new uh, conditions. The rainfalls, although the significant change on the average rainfall is not observed, there is a tendency toward an increase in rainfall extreme event and the significant in the sum in the numbers of our rain days. And the maximum and the minimum temperature also significant increase with few exceptions. High temperature extreme decrease significant in frequency. Across that country, mean annual temperature have increased at least 1.5 times. The observed, glo uh, uh, the observed global average increase of 0 0.65. So in last 50 years. Another uh, story, it's a good story, I don't think it's a good story, it's load shading. It's very common in South Africa. So that says the load shading schedule for South Africa. So at a different stage, stage one, two, three, until eight. So stage one, that says some area that should uh, switch over the electricity for two and a half hours. If the big shortage happened to that country and then some areas can be even stage eight, which is quite a big number of hours, more than eight hours, seven hours per day. So this you can see different stage, but say the period, the time to switch off the light. Let's say South Africa, we couldn't supply enough uh, electricity to this country. And uh, ESCOM is the sole supply of electricity to South Africa and Africa. It provides uh, provide 90% of South Africa electricity and about 45% of Africa electricity. There are 30 power stations with uh, the generation capacity of about 45 gigawatt. The coal-fired power station is about 77%. It's very high. So almost 80% of power station generated by by the coal, the fire coal. 85% access, 85% of, uh, of, of the residents access electricity. So in the urban area, it's about 90%. In the rural area, it's about 77. The, another important is the power generation is only about 30%. Very low energy generation efficiency. And uh, Fortunately, South Africa government realized this challenge. And uh, in the recent years, they launched different program to stimulate the company, the industry, and uh, the citizens to consider to use the renewable energy 
and also try to introduce the energy efficiency technologies. And uh, I'm going to talk something about my area, uh, refrigeration. Refrigeration, okay, we always considered the, the green gases, uh, the, 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 the greenhouse gases are mainly come from the power generation, which is CO2. Actually, refrigeration also created the greenhouse gases from both sides. One is the power consumption directly. The second one is because of the refrigerant. Refrigerant is a gas which has, a, also most of them, they have the global warming potential. So that is the, the my, research, my research area. The first one is the environment friendly refrigeration. So there's a refrigerant, natural refrigerant we use is CO2 and the hydrocarbon, including the ice building and the propane. So this is one area. And then the second area is we see we work on the heat pump, heat pump for the water heating, heat pump for the transportation. So this is the program we implemented. And the transport refrigeration, that's a was supported by GRZ. And, uh, and combined with the industry. And then the reduction of this refrigerant charge is about 60%. And the renewable energy used for the refrigeration, that is an example. We use the solar energy for driving, uh, to drive the refrigeration system for transport refrigeration. That's is some, some pictures. And uh, actually in South Africa, we're very, we have very good radiation, solar radiation. And the uh, next one is a heat pump. We use a heat pump to generate the hot water and also for the water heating. This is energy efficiency technologies. And then the last one I mentioned is energy efficiency of the cooked chain. All these refrigeration facilities used for the cooked chain are energy consumption. And from the experience we know, the energy saving potential is very huge. To save the energy, about 30%, even higher than 30%, is not the difficult job. So that is something, mainly we work on the good room and transportation. So more or less, this is information. As I said, I'm not the people who work directly to work on the climate change, but it's just related to the climate change. And that is everyone's job I related to the cl climate change. Thank you very much. And we close the opening round with Professor Georgi, and he is now going to the oceans, I think. Well, uh, many thanks to the organizer for inviting me to this panel, especially to Susanna Boyken and Niven and Igor. Uh, I am a biologist, and so I talk uh, from a vision uh, from the biology and from the ecology of the problem, and also for the oceans as uh, ego. Um, well, um, we do you know the photosynthesis process that uh, carbon dioxide and water in presence of chlorophyll and sunlight energy produce sugar and uh, release oxygen. Uh, this uh, process uh, is um, appear all the days, uh, all the year, and um, was uh, made by the uh, autotroph, uh, the vegetals and the algae. The cyanobacteria as the first uh, algae that appear in the air with the capability to make photosynthesis and coat carbon dioxide and release oxygen. Then appear other algae and then appear the plants many years later. When the plant appear, uh, colonize the land and then of many years, the vegeta vegetation of the line return to the water and recolonize the water bodies, the oceans and also the continental water. 
So several types of macroalgae were also developed in aquatic uh, water, uh, in aquatic environment uh, with the um, uh, macrophytes and vascular plants. Currently, there are macroalgae and aquatic plants in fresh water and in marine water. However, in continental water, there are reduced their presence by the contamination uh, problems that Dr. Salivian uh, said previously. In, in the Mediterranean Sea, Dr. Duarte, uh, from Spanish, determined that uh, um, 30% of the coverage of Posidonia, uh, Posidonia is a plant in the Mediterranean Sea, reduce the coverage in, um, in this percent. Uh, and year to year, the reduction is higher. Uh, also, in our country, uh, in, in Chile, we have macrocystes perifera in the Patagonian coast of Chile and Argentina that would uh, have similar problems. So, uh, this plan um, are in reduction in the surface that they occur. In aquatic plant, uh, if aquatic plant disappear, the ability to capture carbon from the atmosphere is greatly reduced. In addition, many of these plants have uh, the ability to retain heavy metals and also other contaminants. So, Although all the aquatic plants disappear, and macroalgae also disappear, uh, and they are key species in the ecosystem, uh, but if they lack, uh, the um, cyanobacteria remain, but the cyanobacteria produce toxin to the human skin and also to fishes, so it's preferred that uh, we conserve the macrophytes. Also, uh, in, the last <clears throat> in the last year, many programs have been made to grow more trees to, the, to capture carbon. But when fire, such as those of Australia and Brazil, uh, uh, take on fire the forest, the carbon returns to the atmosphere. atmosphere. So uh, we had the problem that can store in the life the uh, excess of carbon. But uh, in aquatic environment, uh, if the recovery of uh, aquatic plant is produced, uh, we can found a mitigation action to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, you can say that uh, carbon dioxide uh, saturates the systems of the plants, but in aquatic system, there are an equilibrium system, carbonate, bicarbonate, that reduce the presence of carbon dioxide in the water. So uh, this prevents the excess of carbon dioxide. This is not a solution of all the problem, only a contribution to the mitiga mitigation, the excess of atmospheric uh, carbon. So uh, this is my, my message. Thank you. So thank you very much. And now we had, ha have had an introductory note from all the panelists. And uh, now we can open um, the floor for questions. I found it quite interesting, the slide that the Republic of Cattle is the third largest uh, emittent of uh, greenhouse gases. And maybe as here, the most of participants are Argentinian and Brazilians. Maybe would you uh, become vegetarians in order to delete the third largest uh, country? in greenhouse gas emissions. But now please, we try to gather a few questions uh, and then the panelists uh, will answer. Who wants to be first? 
Osmar Coelho from Brazil University. There's a Brazilian joke that says, when you put three families in a small apartment, things become very hard, you know. But if you put an extra cow inside the apartment, three families, like 15 people plus a cow, it becomes a hell. I think the decadal events, climate events, like El Nino, El Nina, is the cow. So the situation is, is difficult. I think the layer of the mattress has become thin and thinner for us. But we can do things, like uh, another example, in uh, 2005, we had a drought in the Amazon region. The areas where the Amazon River stopped to flow were the areas, the most deforested areas. So if we did, if we, if we, if we do our job, if we manage better our resources, we can deal with the climate or the weather. But the thing is, we need to make something. Because in terms of, see, water crisis around the world, my city, Brasilia, it had been in, in a crisis for two years. Rationing water for every family in the city is the capital of Brazil. So, and Sao Paulo city, and the list goes on. So the idea is uh, something's happening. So we have to address that seriously. Thanks. Okay, first answer to Ingo's question. I'm little by little becoming a vegetarian, but <laughs> haven't got, gotten there yet. Uh, the question is about consumption habits. So uh, taking your question as you know, a starting point. Uh, you talked about consumption of meat, and, and I guess that's a very serious problem because it involves um, the, the kind of uh, land use and um, cattle produces, uh, cattle produce, you know, uh, uh, lots of emissions and so on. So uh, the question is how to change those habits in terms of um, individuals' behavior and public policies? Uh, a nice story about uh uh, this problem, uh, it's about um, a frog. If you put uh, a frog in uh, hot water, it will jump out. But if you put frog in the cold water and then increase the temperature, it will get cooked alive. And this is something that looks like hap it, it is happening uh, uh, to us. I remember uh, in Rio, Ingo had an excellent uh, lecture in which he explained why we have this problem and why it's so difficult to solve it. You probably all remember the Montreal Protocol uh, about uh, the ozone problem. We solved it. The ozone hole is getting smaller and smaller. But why it was so easy uh, to solve the ozone problem? Because the same companies that were delivering uh, bad coolants are now delivering good coolants. So the problem was easy to resolve. But with the climate change, in order to resolve the problem, we have to completely replace economy based on fossil fuels, means closing down all the fossil fuel companies and uh, move to something completely different. So it will not be the same players who will... Uh, uh, take over the new economy to be some other players. And according to International Monetary Fund, uh, there are subsidies of $5,200 billion per year for fossil fuels. It's a lot of money that supports many jobs, many people, and many media, and it's very difficult to uh, uh, to, to bring uh, strong scientific arguments to the public uh, space in order to uh, start changing policies towards uh, mitigation. So, uh, 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 based on uh, Ingo's uh, lecture the last time, do you see a little bit more light uh, uh, two years later? Uh, also the other panelists, uh, do you think we can do it? Because we have techno-economical means, but the problems are socio 
or political? I, uh, I heard um, South Africa government that Cape Town uh, will run out of drinking water uh, by mid-year. Um, I don't know this is, is true. So uh, at the same time, um, I haven't seen in the Cape Town many health problems due to the lack of water. Um, uh, what will happen to people? Do you know? I'm not sure I understand exactly your question, and maybe the panelist, someone can help me to make sure I say the question. But I know there's a relation to Cape Town and water issues. Uh, that story, uh, I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly what that story. Uh, but really, this is for South Africa. The water supply is really is a challenge. And uh, in terms of there is a water treatment. And uh, based on my observation, more and more people just use the water, just buy the domestic uh, fourteen the fourteen system, and then use for the domestic application. Uh, water quality really is one of the issue, and uh, I don't want to talk about political things. This is uh, can be the challenge to everywhere in South Africa, and the standard is there. I think last just before the 1994, everything is good in the orders, but now in the recent 20, 30 years of time, uh, standard is also there. But the implementation of the policy, the regulation, is always the challenge. Maybe yes about uh, naming and uh, partially to um, Eduardo question about the consumerism and uh, lifestyle and everything. Yes, I agree with you that it is extremely difficult to redirect the uh, subvention subsidies from fossil fuels to more to cleaner to cleaner fuels and then in order to have uh, low carbon based uh, economy development, we need new players, not uh, fossil fuel players anymore, but more renewables. But we see significant uh, shifts in the market. And we see, uh, I, show, I, show, I, show, I showed the graph, we see a lot of IT companies uh, uh, with main IT business investing in renewables. And we also have a number of examples when fossil fuel companies leave their portfolio of fossil fuel but invest in, in renewables. Uh, so it will be extremely difficult, but uh, I think the technological progress uh, and maturity of renewable energy and low carbon e energy technology will make uh, their contribution towards that and uh, this uh, these uh, driving uh, costs of renewable energy technologies uh, will uh, make uh, uh, no, will make will open more space for uh, for creating uh, operational business models and uh, uh, interests for more of the people more and more to invest in these technologies. Uh, regarding the lifestyle and consumerism, I think that uh, uh, here we have. Uh, to make uh, substantial take in from social sciences. We have to include in all this analysis psychologists and everything in order to teach us <laughs> how to change human behavior because it's all about, it's not always about resources, but uh, it's, m sometimes it's more about changing habits. So uh, we have to uh, widen the, the scope of uh, climate research and science in order to uh, be able to, uh, to take more out of uh, social sciences. And also social sciences uh, could help to reshape the markets, to reshape, in, integrate, integrate it in thing, these uh, social benefits into evaluation of technologies and so on. Uh, so this is the way how, how uh, the societies can be uh, progressively changed towards acceptance of this, uh, of more and more uh, 
um, sustainable technologies and behaviors. Thank you. I think that the problem is that we have only one Navy, the Earth, and uh, the change, uh, the technologic change, uh, and the cultural change were more slowly than the, um, the damage of the support environment. So we have uh, now this problem and I think that we must uh, see uh, new, uh, uh, new aspect in the technology that the company uh, invert and, uh, and the company came uh, the look about the problem. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, the situation. <laughs> I also would like to answer or try to answer first Eduardo's question, how to make the people act. And I think it's extremely difficult or what I experience is that uh, whenever people have a good life, they refuse to any change because every change could make the situation then worse. And uh, that I experience, especially in my own country, it's not only related to energy and climate change. Every change in life is refused to, at least in the first step. And uh, when I see to energy, there are always a few early movers. If it was for photovoltaic plants, if it was for wind turbines, now it's uh, for e-cars, a few first movers we have, but a lot have fear going to e-cars a lot of fear of going to wind turbines and so on. And therefore, I think we only get a few people who are motivated just by innovation. And then, even it's not popular to say, I think legislation always plays a big role. And I remember, for example, when the European Union abandoned uh, incandescent light bulbs there was an enormous hard discussion in my country. It's impossible. We love our light bulbs. The light is so much more beautiful than the LED lamps and so on. And some people, before it was abandoned, they bought hundreds of light bulbs and stored it in their house so that they have them forever. Now it's abandoned and I think everybody loves nowadays uh, LED lights because you completely can have new lighting scenes in your house with LEDs. And so I think sometimes it's just necessary that we uh, force also people when we know it is good for or it is good against climate change, there is a need uh, also for legislation. And when I try to answer Nevens, uh, I'm still, I think political decision, we still have national policies. Even we have in Europe, the European Union, a lot is made on national governments. And the one I can judge best on is my own. And there I'm still quite negative. For example, we now have uh, decided, it's a political decision to phase out coal in 2038. Um, but I call it a bit uh, when we had the Brexit discussion and there we had a so-called backstop for the North Island solution. And I explain a bit, uh, the coal industry also has a backstop solution in Germany. Um, they all even say in the law, uh, the 2038 phase out, uh, but we earlier in 2030, we will have a look, maybe we can make it earlier. But in the same sense of thinking, there's also, ah, we have a look, maybe we need it even longer. And when we have a look at the moment, we have in our country much higher hurdles to install new wind parks. Uh, we already lost uh, a lot of empl employment in solar industry. I always make the joke, uh, we don't lost employment, but the employment now is in China. <laughs> so. Um, 
And I think at the moment we install so less solar and wind that maybe in the year 2030 we see, ah, we cannot switch off our coal because uh, we have switched then off the nuclear power plants and now we just haven't installed uh, enough wind and solar. So, oh, sorry, we need to go on with coal. So I'm, in my own country, I'm quite negative. I was very positive in my own country in the early 2000s. I was always proud when I can give talks uh, worldwide on the energy transition. But I think nowadays a lot of countries have a much more advanced policy than Germany has. I also just want to comment that is uh, the application of the renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency technologies is not only impacted by the policy, by the what's it, the financial support, and the lifestyle as well as the culture is also very important. Uh, South Africa has a very rich solar energy compared to any, any other areas. Average is 800,000 watt per square. And uh, the government and the recommend to use uh, solar, water and the solar PV technology, etc. but the progress is very, very slow. For example, just to give you the example, I stayed in an estate, and then there's uh, the company of the estate. Not allowed us, they don't allow us to use the solar thermal water heating. They don't allow us to, they don't allow us to use the solar PV for power generation. Uh, but I try to use it because I just hide it. Because they care about the, the look, how does it look like the buildings from outside? And then I just use uh, another areas, just uh, use the solar PV. And then from there, I can see, I can see with the, not the solar PV, solar thermal. I can see with the energy more than 30%. Currently, the big, big number of the people use is electrical geyser. It's electrical geyser. So that means what I'm seeing is the country is very important and the lifestyle is also very important. This is also the difficult one. Let's have a few more questions in the audience, in case there are. Uh, yes, many of you spoke of government uh, in being involved in this change. Do you see government having a role in some sort of uh, limiting population growth? We had a Professor Georgi speaking for the oceans, and I would like to speak for the sea, small seas like uh, Adriatic Sea and Mediterranean Sea is very small towards the oceans. What we face is eutrophication, which is really turning the small seas into a swamp with a um, lot of nutrients that are produced by emissions and are being dissolved in the water, causing acidification and increasing the temperature. However, modern big countries, developed countries, came to the policies that are stopping this, and uh, North America, uh, Baltic, and English Channel has been protected by emission control uh, areas. This is areas that are being better controlled and that are forbidding and making higher standards for emission controls from marine traffic. Now, I'm wondering why, how is it possible that uh, such policies are not being then discussed on a smaller seas and other maybe less developed countries who also need to protect their habitat. So the question is, when is Mediterranean going to discuss the mission control area and especially Adriatic and Mediterranean? When is South America going to discuss that? I think that the mission control may, must be controlled, uh, in particular in energy generation. Uh, I refer uh, the plant problem about uh, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, now stored in the atmosphere. So uh, this is a problem. Uh, if, if we control the emission now, we now have more carbon dioxide than uh, the, uh, the necessary in the, to the life. Uh, so we think that 
the, uh, all the, the measures are necessary uh, now and um, very quickly because the supporting systems is um, in problem. The increase of temperature of uh, some uh, sea and some areas uh, generate problems to the preserve uh, and uh, the emission, also uh, some atmospheric, uh, some gases, and also uh, the life uh, increase the respiration in the system and this support carbon dioxide. So uh, it's a complex <laughs> problem, but uh, it must be controlled uh, from two both both sides, the emissions and the absorption. Uh, about the first question, it was about uh, population growth and energy relationship. I, uh, I don't know, uh, did you attend yesterday uh, my uh, invited talk? I presented a uh, number of uh, projections for population growth depending on different narratives or storyline, how uh, is perceived. And we see different, uh, le different uh, projections starting from 7 billion in, by the end of the century towards uh, 13 billion, but also uh, some of the, some of the um, uh, elements of uh, socio socio-economic context is uh, 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 underlining the specific storyline is how the energy is produced and how the energy is consumed. And in some of the storylines, we see that uh, we have a strong decoupling of uh, population growth and, uh, uh, and energy demand. A bit uh, uh, because on, on the production side, uh, we have more uh, focus on renewable energy and we have 100% of transformation of uh, primary energy uh, to final energy, meaning that uh, with less primary energy, we can, we can uh, uh, satisfy the same services and needs. On the other side, uh, those, uh, I would say, um, context is following sustain sustainability patterns. They also include uh, uh, technologies on demand side with, which use uh, uh, energy efficiently. So, uh, yes, the population growth is very important uh, and uh, um, but it's not uh, included um, in the decarbonization uh, policies uh, as a factor uh, to be limited, but rather to, uh, to act or uh, rather to shape, reshape the way how the energy is produced and how the energy is used. So we can experience decoupling between population growth and uh, energy demand. I'm not really an expert on that, on population growth and energy, but I think we all know these correlating curves, uh, more population, more energy, more greenhouse gases, higher global uh, temperatures. Uh, the question is whether governments should uh, make policy in order to control the population. I have a bit of a bad feeling. I think when we, when we think of uh, controlling birth, then we think of decreasing population. And maybe I give an example again from my country. Our government always says we need to have more people. And their motivation is not we need more people because uh, of greenhouse gases. They think of the pensions, of the retirement, so people are getting older and older. We need much more young people in order to finance the old people. And I think that is a very bad uh, policy we have because then we, we should more think we need a new social system in order uh, instead of having more population in a country that is already densely, very densely populated. My country is 
very densely populated. Uh, we have doubled the people than Argentina, but on a very small space. So I think uh, I have a problem with uh, <laughs> birth control by uh, policy, but for sure it would be good when we have less people. But Neven also wants to comment on that. Demography is a very, very slow process. Uh, and we don't have time to um, actually act on that one if we want to save climate. We need, uh, we have around 10 years to um, completely change energy policy. And in 10 years, nothing happens on the demographic front. Uh, anyway, uh, we have uh, stopped demographic explosion in most of the world. Uh, apart from Africa, there is no demographic growth. So uh, this is not a major issue anymore. It has been solved by uh, itself or by uh, previous policies. Um, uh, we have uh, more now in Europe of this problem that Ingo mentioned, that we have to think about a good exit policy, how to pay for the pensions. And according to UN, uh, European Union needs to import 13 million people per year if we want to pay for the future pensions, which is uh, 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 quite much more than in 2016 when uh, 2 million people entered European Union. So uh, we have to think about uh, long-term effects of the previous demographic policies, uh, but uh, I don't think that, we, uh, that it would be very useful and it would be very controversial to try to uh, concentrate on demographic policy as a way to solve climate problem uh, because it's too slow. The results will be seen in uh, 100 years time. Thank you. So thank you very much. We already could use that as a closing word because we are almost uh, exactly approaching 1 p.m. according to the computer here. So I would like to thank all the audience discussing with us. And I also would like to thank uh, the panelists uh, had been sitting here and presenting and discussing with us. So thank you very much for your presence. <laughs>